Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in for the Commander's Core Studio. Welcome to the show. So a little while back, I did an episode called Tribes That Don't Have a Commander. And on that episode, I talked about, well tribes that don't have a commander and I put forth a commander that I thought well would be pretty cool for that tribe to have. Now again that episode came out quite some time ago and since then actually some of those tribes have gotten commanders like you know in, instead of the squirrels getting squeaky squirrel revolutionary which I still think is an amazing name and an amazing commander they got you know Chatterfang and also Toski so yeah there have been new commanders coming out for tribes that have been commander less. That being said, there are still plenty of tribes out there that don't have a commander, so on this episode, I'm going to be taking you through even more tribes that absolutely, in my opinion, need commanders. And of course, I'm going to help fill that void, at least in this episode, by showing off a potential commander for that tribe. Now, before we jump into the episode, though, I want to make sure that you know that you can, as always, blame Eddie in the comments below, because with these commanders, Eddie was crucial, giving some amazing feedback on the commanders, as well as essentially coming up with the main drive for some of these commanders. So, yeah, if you don't like some of these commanders, make sure you blame Eddie in the comments below. And now, with all that said, let's jump into it. And we're going to start off with a tribe that is, of course, near and dear to my heart and kind of doesn't exist in magic because, you know, magic is weird like that. And they're like, hey, no, these are all boars, even though some things are, you know, look like pigs, too. And there actually used to be a pig, but now it's a boar. Regardless, pigs is the first tribe that I want to cover, and they are in desperate need of a commander. So to the rescue comes the three lion-hearted pigs. That's right. These are not the three little pigs anymore. These are the three lion-hearted pigs. And boy, do they look fearsome. Anyways, the three lion-hearted pigs are a 3-3 pig that cost green, blue, red. They have, whenever you cast a green spell, create a 1-1 green pig creature token. Whenever you cast a blue spell, pigs you control gain flying until end of turn. And whenever you cast a red spell, pigs you control get plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. Yeah, like I mentioned before, this probably wasn't the right one to start off on, but come on, with this channel and pigs, I had to start off with it. Pig is technically not a tribe in Magic, though obviously there have been pig cards in the past like Zodiac Pig, which says pig, but it's been a rad to not be a pig, now it's a boar. Regardless, wizards, we need to bring pigs back in a big way. So we need a pig commander that can hold the torch on its own without any other pig cards. So with this commander, simply by casting green spells, you can start to make a pig army, making more and more pig tokens. Whenever you're casting those blue spells, you can make your pigs evasive, and whenever you're casting red spells, you can pump your pigs. Or you could cast spells that have two or even all of the colors and get all of those benefits. So make your pig army, make them evasive, and pump them to hit your opponents for a ton. So let's highlight a few cards that you'd want to consider with a commander like this, like Teamer Charm, Guided Passage, and Teamer Ascendancy. Teamer Charm, like many of the other charms, is a very flexible spell, and again, it's one of each of our colors. So again, for just three mana, not only do we get the effects from this spell, which are choose one target creature control gets plus plus one until on turn it fights our creature you don't control, counter target spell its controller pays three, or creatures with power three or less can't block this turn. And again, on top of that, we get a 1-1 one, one pig, our pigs get flying, and they get pumped too. How about yet another three mana teamer spell, which is fantastic in Commander. It's a very spicy card, Guided Passage. It says reveal the cards in your library and opponent chooses from among them a creature card, a land card, and a non-creature, non-land card. You put the chosen cards in your hand, then shuffle your library. Yeah, an opponent gets to pick these cards, but come on. Three mana for three cards, and again, all those effects from your commander. Sign me up. And of course, you can make your pigs even more effective with Teamer Ascendancy. 
It's an enchantment for green, blue, red, and it says creatures you control have haste. Whenever a creature with power four greater enters the battlefield under control, you may draw a card. First of all, giving our creatures haste can be huge for a deck like this. Again, making more and more pigs and pumping them and being able to swing with them right away and making them evasive. Yeah, that sounds like fun. On top of that, if we maybe have some other creatures that come into play with power four or greater, we can draw some cards, or we can, you know, include some anthems that can pump our pigs, and if we pump them enough, we can gain that card advantage from this as well. But yeah, even outside of three color cards, we can also get a lot of value out of two color cards, with one such as Fires of Yavamaya and Gruel War Chant. Like Team Ascendancy, these are fantastic anthem effects that can really help out our team. Fires of Yavamaya says creatures you control have haste, and we can sacrifice it, and our creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn. And Gruel War Chant's gonna give attacking creatures we control plus one plus zero and menace. So our potentially flying pigs hit even harder, and again, they're gonna be even more difficult to block. And speaking of hitting harder, how about Berserker's Onslaught, which says attacking creatures you control have double strike. So now our attacking pigs can hit incredibly hard, and yeah, just think about even just playing this one card. Yes, this spell is only red, but still, that's gonna pump our team plus two plus zero, so our one one pigs are gonna be three ones, then they're going to hit with double strike, so each of our 1-1s one on that turn are going to hit for 6 damage. We have been well overdue for a pig commander in Magic, and yeah, there's a lot of exciting things that you can do with a commander like this. Moving on to our next tribe that needs a commander, well, uh, okay, bear with me please, this one's a bit out there, but here we go. Cosmic Egg. Now it definitely might not surprise you that there isn't a legendary egg out there just yet. Cosmic Egg is a 0-4 egg with Defender, Shroud, and Indestructible, and it costs 1 mana. So first up, you can never attack with this egg because it has Defender. You cannot target it, but neither can your opponents, and it's got Indestructible, so yeah, this thing is really hard to get off the field. And you're going to want it on the field because it has this. At the beginning of each end step, if an opponent has 10 or more life than their starting life total, 10 or more cards in their hand, and 10 or more lands on the battlefield, transform Cosmic Egg and attach it to that player. So the goal of this commander is to get one opponent to at least 50 life, have 10 or more cards in their hand, and have at least 10 lands on the battlefield. So obviously you're going to want to be helping out that opponent, but they might not want your help because when this flips, it flips into... Curse of the Cosmos, an aura curse that says enchant player, it has shroud and indestructible, it says you control enchanted player, and by paying Wooberg, the enchanted player loses the game. That's right, a perpetual mind slaver effect on a curse. That, you know, also has shroud and indestructible, so it's incredibly hard to get rid of, and yeah, if you just decide to pay Wooberg at some point, the enchanted player loses the game. But of course, you'll want to control them for as long as you need to, you know, just literally control them until you take out the other two opponents, and then it's just you and player that you've cursed, and then you know, eventually just take them out because, um, yeah, that's game over. So you're gonna work to build one player up, working to bolster the number of cards in their hand, their life total, and yes, even the number of lands on the battlefield, though this is a tricky thing to do. Because obviously your opponents are going to know the exact requirement for, you know, this to actually flip, so they're going to do their best to avoid you hitting that requirement. They might not be able to take the egg out very easily because, again, of that shroud and indestructibility, etc, 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 but they can do their best to avoid having a lot of cards in their hand or their life total getting very high. And again, the hardest thing for you to do is to force that player to actually get lands in play. Now, there are some cards that, you know, allow players to each search for a land and put into play, but the vast majority of pretty much all those cards say may, and also players can just, you know, fail to find. Regardless, if you are benefiting all players and letting them play more and more lands, some players might want to not get behind, and they might be willing to take that risk to get the number of lands that they control to be 10 or greater, thinking that they're okay as long as they can keep their hand total down and also their life total down. And okay, I just said hand total. You know what, I meant the cards in the hand. You know what I mean. Regardless, yeah, this is definitely a group hug style deck with a very dark, dark side to it. So of course you can include a lot of cards that force players to actually gain life or a fantastic one like Arbiter of Norridge, which brings everyone up to the highest life total among all players. And of course, there are plenty of ways to force players to draw cards like, you know, Folio Fantasies, which has pay X, X, tap, each player draws X cards, and on top of that, it says players have no maximum hand size, so good luck to your opponents trying to get underneath that 10 mark. And again, of course, you can include plenty of ways to incentivize your opponents to get more cards and more lands, like Rites of Flourishing. 
It says that at the beginning of each player's draw step, the player draws an initial card, and each player may play initial land on each of their turns. So again, if some players, like, you know, yourself, are getting more and more lands into play, you're going to be getting ahead of other players, and players might at some point get, you know, to 9 lands, and then maybe just risk it and go above 10. And of course, like I mentioned before, you can tempt them with other cards like a Root Weaver Druid. It has, when it enters the battlefield, each opponent may search a library for up to three basic land cards. They each put one of those cards onto the battlefield tapped under your control and the rest on the battlefield under their control. Then each player search the library this way shuffles it. Now again, when this happens, again, your opponents don't have to search. It says may search, so they don't have to actually go get any lands. That being said, there actually are some sneaky ways to force this by utilizing something like Fractured Identity. It says exile target non permanent. Each player other than its controller creates a token that's a copy of it. So by giving each of our opponents an ETB of their own Root Weaver Druid, well, we can choose to go search for lands and then get lands into play under their control. Or as Eddie pointed out, you can do something really sneaky by forcing the issue with a Shia, Soul of the Wild. It has non-token creatures you control are forest lands in addition to their other types. So if you fracture identity this, congratulations, you've turned all of your opponent's creatures into forests. And of course, from there, that's going to add to their total land count. And if they've got more than 10, well, you've got it. Like I said, this commander might be hard to deal with, but its requirement can be pretty hard to meet, but there are ways to do it, and that payoff is pretty awesome. Well, well for you, not for the player that you're perpetually mind slavering. Regardless, now let's move on to yet another tribe that, well, I think needs a commander of its own with Starfish. And yeah, if you've seen a, a, a certain recent movie with a certain villain, this might seem familiar. So may I introduce you to Zinquox the Starfish Lord. Zinquox is a 3-5 starfish that costs blue blue blue, red red, and it has Enrage. Whenever it's dealt damage, create a 1-1 one, one blue and red starfish creature token. And then you can sacrifice X starfish to gain control of target creature with power X or less. So Zinquox is all about taking damage over and over again to build a massive starfish army. And then of course you can utilize those starfish to take control of your opponent's creatures. Now depending on how large the creature is based upon again their power, it's going to take more starfish to actually gain control of them. But of course there are plenty of ways out there to make the most use out of your starfish. And of course there are also ways to make a lot of starfish very quickly. So first up, let's talk about Warstorm Surge, Blazing Sunsteel, and Pyrohemia. Warstorm Surge is an enchantment that costs 5 and a red, and it says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. This card works incredibly well with Zinquox, because as soon as you take 1 damage with Zinquox, well, you're going to be making a Starfish, and that Starfish is a 1-1. That enters the battlefield, Warstorm Surge says, cool, let's deal 1 more damage to Zinquox. Then you make another Starfish which enters the battlefield, and Warstorm Surge is going to deal one more damage to Zinquox. So you can keep doing this just up to the point where you're almost about to kill Zinquox. Again, you basically would be making four Starfish each time. And actually, I should mention this, if you are able to make Zinquox indestructible, well, you can just do this an infinite number of times to make as many Starfish as you want. And also, you know, at the same time, gaining control of your opponent's entire board. In a similar way, there's Blazing Sunsteel, which says equipped creature gets plus one plus zero for each opponent you have, and whenever equipped creature is dealt damage, deals that much damage to any target. So again, in a very similar way, when Zinquox is dealt damage, you can have it deal damage to itself, over and over again for as long as it can survive. So you can make Starfish after Starfish after Starfish, and again, if it's indestructible, you can do this as many times as you want. Next up though, let's talk about Pyrohemia, which is a card that you're going to be really careful with with this kind of a commander. It says at the beginning of the end step, if no creatures are on the battlefield, sacrifice Pyrohemia, and by paying a red, it's going to deal 1 damage to each creature and each player. So this is a great way to make more and more starfish, but also it can take out your starfish. So you have to be really careful and actually, you know, sacrifice your starfish to gain control of something else before you actually ping things again. Or maybe you've got ways to increase toughness. This is definitely an included in the deck that you have to be careful with. Some cards that you don't have to be as careful with, though, and that can be incredibly effective in this deck are ones that Eddie pointed out, like Polymorphous Jest, Mass Diminish, and Vidalcan Humiliator. Polymorphous Jest says, until end of turn, each creature target player controls, loses all abilities, and becomes a 1-1 blue frog with base power and toughness 1-1. So by making one of our opponent's creatures into 1-1 one, one frogs, it makes them a lot easier to steal with our starfish, and they become a lot more efficient at doing so. Essentially, you know, as long as they don't have any equipment that pump them, or, you know, counters on them, we're just going to be sacrificing one starfish for one creature. 
And though at the time that we steal them, again, they're just gonna be 1-1 one, one frogs, that doesn't really matter all that much, because again, that ends at the end of the turn, and then they turn back into whatever massive creatures they were. So we can also utilize Mass Diminish, which is basically the exact same thing, but it says until your next turn, creature target player controls have base power and toughness 1-1, one, one, but we can also flash it back so we can do it again. And the Vidalcan Humiliator is another repeatable effect. It says, Metalcraft, whenever it attacks, if you control three or more artifacts, creature opponents control lose all abilities and have base power and toughness 1-1 one, one into one of turn. So as long as we have Metalcraft, this thing can be absolutely incredible in this kind of attack. So yeah, I think a commander like Zinquox could put Starfish on the map in a big way. And speaking of putting a creature type on the map, let's talk about Ogmiok the Desolator. Because who doesn't love the creature type of Leech? Ew, gross, I know. Anyways, it's a 5-5 legendary Leech that costs Wooburg. It also says spells you cast cost Wooburg more to cast. So that is a massive downside, but wait, it gets even better, or, or worse, I guess. Because when it enters the battlefield, sacrifice all other non-land permanents you control. So with that first part, you might have been thinking, okay, well, before I get Ogmiok out, you know, I'll just cast all my other things, get them in play, and then I'll be fine because I don't have to cast other things. Um, but no, uh, you have to sacrifice everything in play except for your lands. And then, of course, to rebuild, your spells are going to cost more to cast. Now, obviously, if the text just stopped right there, this would probably be the worst commander in history, um, but uh, we have uh, some upside here, too. Because Akmiok the Desolator, of course, has whenever an opponent casts a spell, they lose three life, you gain three life and create a treasure token. So again, this commander comes with massive downsides. It's going to cost a ton more to cast. When it enters the battlefield, it makes us sacrifice everything else, but also has a huge upside in that it also is going to be very punishing to our opponents when they cast any spell. They're going to be losing life at a very fast pace. We're going to be gaining a ton of life, and we're also going to be getting treasure tokens to help us, you know, actually try to cast some spells. So this legendary leech is not only leeching off us, but it is most definitely leeching off our opponents once we get it into play. Now, one thing I will say is that there is definitely a way to get around that enter the battlefield trigger. Maybe if you can get a torpor orb or something like that into play first, so you actually take out that downside, that's one way to do it. Or you can kind of lean into that downside, though. You know, with creatures or other things that actually want to be put in your graveyard, like Psalm Simulacrum, Chasm Skulker, and Gamekeeper. Sad Robot, of course, has when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, tap, then shuffle, and when it dies, you can draw a card. And speaking of drawing cards, Chasm Skulker has, whenever you draw a card, put a plus plus one counter on Chasm Skulker, and when it dies, you get X11 one, one blue squared creature tokens with Island Walk Rex, the number of counters on Chasm Skulker. And then Gamekeeper has, whenever it dies, you may exile it. If you do reveal cards in the top of your library to reveal a creature card, put that card in the battlefield, and put all other cards for this way into your graveyard. So by preparing ahead of time, you know, before you actually, you know, get your commander in play and lose everything, you can rebuild, you know, while your commander is just wiping out all your other things. Get Getting some benefits from losing your non-land permanence is better than just losing everything. Or, you know, we can take the deck in a somewhat different direction by sharing the love of this leech legend. So maybe you want to consider some donate cards like Harmless Offering, or maybe more so cards like Assault Suit and Fractured Identity. Harmless Offering says target opponent gains control of target permanent you control. So instead of just hanging on to your lovely leech, well, just send it over to an opponent, and now their spells cost a ton more to cast. And, um, uh, if they don't have, you know, Wooburg, it's gonna be really hard for them to cast. They're gonna have to wait to get a good amount of treasure to actually cast their spells. So that's where Assault Suit also comes in. It says, Equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, has haste, and can't attack your planeswalker you control, and it can't be sacrificed. And on top of that, at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, you may have that player gain control of Equipped creature until end of turn if you do untap it. So share the commander around to everyone, so each player on their turn essentially is gonna have an incredibly difficult time ever casting spells. And if you want to make things go absolutely bonkers, cast Fracture Identity and see what happens. Again, like I mentioned before, this one basically exiles target non-land permanent. Each player other than its controller creates a token that's a copy of it. So exile your Leech Legend and give all of your opponents a token copy of it. Each of those ETB, they have to sacrifice all their non-land things. And then, yeah, it's going to be incredibly painful when any player, including yourself, casts a single spell. So have fun. Yeah, that would make for a very interesting game, and again, I think this is a very interesting commander concept with a massive downside, again, basically two massive downsides and one major upside as well.
Next up, let's move on to yet another creature type that I believe could use some love from wizards with a Dothy commander. We've got Zakat's Dothy Overlord, a 4-3 Dothy that costs black, 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 and it has shadow, so this creature can only block or be blocked by only creatures with shadow, and it says other creatures you control have shadow. Now, shadow is a keyword that you pretty much don't see at all in Commander. There are very few creatures that see play in Commander that actually have shadow, so basically this just means, hey, you can't be blocked, but you also can't block. And that's essentially what this commander does for your entire army. Hey, all of your creatures are unblockable. That is an absolutely incredible effect. Oh, but also, you can't block anything. So that's a very high risk, very high reward play. Now, of course, there are ways to really take advantage of this and also ways to maybe make it so that your opponents might not want to actually attack you, even though they can just openly attack you and you wouldn't be able to stop them. First up though, let's talk about the benefits that you can get from ensuring that you can essentially hit your opponents with things like Grim Hireling, Necropolis Regent, and of course, Phage the Untouchable. Grim Hireling says whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create two treasure tokens. Again, since we're guaranteed to get through with our creatures essentially again because no one else really runs creatures with a shadow, we can just get through and basically get what? Again, if we have three opponents, six treasure tokens every single time we attack? Again, assuming we're attacking, you know, each player with at least one creature, you know what I mean. And of course, we can also make our creatures absolutely massive with Necropolis Regent, a 6-5 vampire with flying, which again, flying doesn't really matter when you've got shadow. It says whenever a creature you control deals common damage to a player, put that many plus one counters on it. So every single combat, our creatures are essentially going to double in power. But power only gets you so far, you know, in comparison to something like Phage the Untouchable, which would be absolutely incredible with Shadow. Phage is a 4-4 Avatar minion that costs 3 black, 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 black. When she enters the battlefield, if you didn't cast it from your hand, you lose the game. So let's make sure we cast her from our hand. When she deals combat damage to a creature, destroy that creature, can't be regenerated. Yeah, let's skip that part because again with Shadow, well, we're not going to be exactly blocking and they're not going to be blocking her either. And of course, the reason why Phage is so incredible, whenever Phage deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game. So yeah, unless that opponent happens to have a creature with Shadow, they're gone. But again, like I mentioned before, since our creatures do have shadow, there's also a downside where we can't block our opponent's creatures, but luckily, Eddie pointed out some fantastic cards that can help us out. Like you know, Revenge of Ravens, No Mercy, and Hellish Rebuke. Revenge of Ravens says whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, that creature's controller loses one life and you gain one life. So this can be a punishing effect saying, okay, you can swing at me, but you're going to be losing some life and I'm going to be gaining some life. And speaking of punishing effects, No Mercy says whenever a creature deals damage to you, destroy it. So your opponents can swing out and hit you, but they might just lose their entire army. And of course, even if you don't have anything on the field like these enchantments, you still might have a Hellish Rebuke in your hand, which can be fantastic if your opponent swings out at you. It says, until end of turn, permanent your opponent's control gain. When this permanent deals damage to the player who cast Hellish Rebuke, sacrifice this permanent you lose to life. So they can end up losing a lot of things and losing a lot of life in the process too. Again, I really like the concept of a Dothy commander that has a high upside with a high potential downside, but a lot of fun interactions in between. But our final creature type that most definitely needs a commander is goats. Of course it's goats. And actually you might be thinking, wait, 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 wait. Isn't there already a goat commander out there with Zedru? Uh, actually, Zedru is technically a minotaur, which, yeah, I know, it looks like a goat. Shouldn't Zedru be a goat? Anyways, it's not. So here you go, we've got the goat. And if you're wondering why it's capitalized, well, it's because um, goat, G-O-A-T, means greatest of all time. And this commander is definitely the greatest goat of all time. It's a 1-1 goat that costs 1 red, green, white, but it has double strike, haste, and trample, and it says other creatures you control lose all abilities and are 1-1 green goats with exalted. So yeah, get ready for a truckload of spiciness with this commander. All of your other creatures, it doesn't matter how large they are or how many abilities they have or whatnot, they lose everything. But you know what? They become 1-1 goats with exalted. Because those creatures don't matter. They only exist for the purpose of making the goat even better. So your goats are going to sit on the sideline while they watch the goat go out and smack your opponents for a ton. The more goats you have in play, the bigger the goat gets when it swings. And yeah, this thing can dish out a ton of damage again with double strike, haste, and trample. 
So, of course, we're going to want to make a lot of things that are going to become goats with things like Goblin Assault and Assemble a Legion. Goblin Assault is an enchantment that costs 2 in a red and says at the beginning of your upkeep create a 1-1 one, one red Goblin Creature token with haste, and Goblin Creatures attack each turn of Fable. Again, that does not matter at all, because usually that would be a downside, but with this commander, it's like, okay, we're gonna make a 1-1 one, one red goblin. Oh wait, no, now it's a goat. Okay, that doesn't matter that goblins have to attack each turn of Fable, because they're goats. And then Assembly Legion says at the beginning of your upkeep, put a muster counter on Assemble Legion, then put a 1-1 one, one red and white soldier creature token with haste on the battlefield for each muster counter on Assemble Legion. Or in other words, make a goat. Make more goats. Keep making more and more goats. Next up, of course, additional combat spells like Relentless Assault can help out as well to pump our commander even more on the swings. It says, untap all creatures that attack this turn after this main phase, additional combat phase, while additional main phase. Or in other words, hey, extra combat, swing with the goat again, have fun. And of course, in these colors, we also have access to ways to, well, protect ourselves because our other tiny little goat creatures aren't going to do all that well doing so. Well, we've got cards like Ghostly Prison, Disruptacorum, and Fog. Ghostly Prison says creatures can't attack you unless the controller pays two for each creature they control that's attacking you. So even if we do leave ourselves somewhat open by swinging with the goat and we don't really want to block with, you know, our weak goat army, our opponents are going to get the pay to attack us. Or we can just force our opponents to attack each other with something like Disrupt Decorum, which says, Goat all creatures you don't control. And of course, we also have access to plenty of fogs in these colors, so we can prevent combat damage we dealt this turn when our opponents decide to attack us. So if we look like we're pretty defenseless with our tiny goats, well, they might swing out, we cast a fog, we blank their attack, and then we say, hey, the goat did not like that, and then we swing back at them for a ton. So yeah, I definitely think a goat commander should be, well, the goat commander. But now as things are wrapping up, well, first up, I really hope that you enjoyed this episode because I really enjoyed making it. There are definitely a ton of deserving tribes out there that could really use a commander. So in the comments below, let me know if you can think of a tribe that you think definitely deserves a commander that doesn't have one yet. And of course, while you're at it, make sure you let me know what your thoughts are on these commanders and these tribes that I think need a commander. And again, if you didn't like any part of this episode, make sure you blame Eddie in the comments below because again, it's always Eddie's fault. And with that, the show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again, and have a good one.